Hello everyone. Uh, I hope you're all well. My name is Paula Toppila. I'm the executive director and curator of IHME Helsinki and my pronoun is she, her. Welcome to join us to Art Science Ecology course. That is a IHME Helsinki initiative and realized in collaboration with Fine Arts Academy of University of Arts and Helsinki Institute of Sustainability Science of University of Helsinki. IHME Helsinki is a contemporary art commissioning agency whose main task is to explore how are we to exist in the age of climate crisis and biodiversity loss as a high quality contemporary art commissioning agency and how are we to collaborate internationally and create relevant discourse and meaning during these challenging times. IMA Helsinki commissions one temporary public artwork annually and the discursive program is being created uh, along the themes of our mission uh, that takes different forms every year. This year's specific discourse is being created with this course that consists out of open for all lectures and workshops aimed at students from the two collaborating universities. I would like to ask the students to visit the Teams platform for tailor-made assignments by the lecturers for further details. Today the workshop will follow right after the lecture. Those students taking part from the lecture tray, Luento Targatin, please write lecture tray and your name in the chat for the teacher to see who are attending. This year, IME Helsinki shall exceptionally produce two public art commissions, namely IME Helsinki Commission 2020, postponed to this, this year due to COVID-19 pandemic by Norwegian artist Diana Binderen, and IME Helsinki Commission 2021, created by Scottish artist Katie Patterson. They have both contributed to this course already, and you can find the recordings of their talks in our YouTube channel. Some household issues before I will introduce you to the speaker. Uh, please keep your microphones and video connection closed during the entire event. Ecological sustainability is important to us and since 2020 IHME aims at carbon neutrality in all its activities. And um, my colleague Baby will post you some links to an article where you can read more about the carbon footprint of the video connection during the remote call. Feedback. We shall do one quick poll in the beginning of the lecture in order to know a little bit about you, our audience, and also in order to develop our practices. You will be given two questions from where are you taking part and where did you learn about this course from? Now you can see the poll, so let's take some seconds for you to reply. There will also be a link to a more profound feedback form in the chat, and we are very happy if you take the time to reply to that too. So it seems that the majority of you are taking part from the capital region of Helsinki, 67%, but also some are participating from outside of the capital region, different parts of Finland, and also 11% of you are joining us from abroad. And you have learned about our event at Facebook, but now there is a new kind of result that the, this course has been recommended to 22% of you. So the word is going around about this course. We are very happy to learn about that. Thank you very much and warmly welcome everyone. Um, questions. We are very happy to have your questions. Uh, please write them in the chat as soon as you are ready and I will take them from there in the end of the lecture and present them to our guests. And uh, safe space rules. We follow safe space guidelines in all our events. The lecture is free from discrimination such as racism, sexism and ableism. So please make everyone feel safe to participate and do not make assumptions about each other based on gender, health, abilities and other stereotypes. You can always give feedback and tell us about discriminatory or other interference to IME Helsinki staff member. 
by email or via the feedback form or here in the chat. Also to let you know that this uh, lecture will be recorded and it will be shared at the IHME YouTube channel later this week. And now to, I have the great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. I'm very happy to have Samir Pohmik here today and here is a little introduction to him. Samir Pohmik is a multidisciplinary artist and architect. He received Doctor of Arts Art and Design from Aalto University, Finland, and a Master of Architecture from the University of Maryland in the United States. Samir's artistic research project, Imaginary Natures, Extractive Media and the Cultural Memory of Environmental Change, funded by Kone Foundation, examines media cultures of extraction through artistic and critical artificial intelligence practices. Samir teaches new media, infrastructures and environment at the Aalto, University, Aalto School of Arts, Design and Architecture. Warmly welcome, Sami. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much, Paula. And uh, <clears throat> thank you, Pavi. It's a great pleasure to be here online in this uh, lecture series. I'm really fortunate to join your wonderful artists here online and talk about these issues. Um, so since uh, we don't have much time and we'll straight away uh, jump into this topic, um, we're talking about media cultures of extraction. It's quite a, a topic that's been around, but not, not so much intensively as we are looking at it today. Um, let's uh, go and share my uh, images and uh, videos. So just, quickly go there and let me play that for you. So you see three pyramids there. So I'll use three different tracks today, three different entry points to enter the world of extraction. And it's all related to media culture. Um, so I'll talk about three different machines um, machines have hardware and software. And, uh, you know, some say like neural network models would just be code, but uh, when you zoom out, even artificial intelligence has physicality, machines, uh, distributed, planetary, and a lot of metals and minerals in them. So I'll use these three machines here to talk through this topic, and it serves as like entry points. But of course, before we go in, you might be wondering what are these pyramids right here? This is not Giza or Egypt. This is the pyramid of extraction. So we're looking, looking at these different devices which sit on top of these pyramids. Um, and what are these? Fractal pyramids, and we call them the Sierpensky, Sierpensky triangle. And it's a visual metaphor, which according to Kate Crawford and Vladan Yola represents the complexity of current extractive practices and current extractivism as we call it today. Crawford and Yola also talk about this phenomenal project, Anatomy of AI System. So we'll look at that later uh, through the lecture, but the most you know, basic structure of this triangle, which is within the pyramid is about labor the product of labor and the means of production. So, so bottom left is labor, bottom right means of production and top is the product of labor. And each of these pyramids are made of a million different pyramids, thousands of pyramids. And each pyramid sits on top of each other. And on top we see this, these amazing devices sitting on top. But the point of this diagram is also that I realized that linear display will not enable us to show the next step of production and exploitation of the previous phases. But we're looking at this through a fractal vision, a sort of a fractal metaphor of extraction. And each pyramid is a piece of the puzzle. And, and, and you know, it's gonna take 
a long time we can even dig down to the bottom of the pyramid. But for today, we just go over the very basics of this structure and look at these amazing three different machines. You know, I always thought the iPhone, the iPhone, we all, iPhone is always the scapegoat as usual. So I always thought the iPhone was on top of the food chain. Um, then it was the AI assistant, the Amazon Echo. Um, then, you know, last month we saw the Mars rover Perseverance in Mars. And then I realized, wow, there's another device I need to add to the top of the pyramid there. And why? You know, these devices are the ultimate machines. These are the ultimate, they encompass all technologies ever made. And it takes, and the Mars rover especially takes all this to an extraterrestrial level, otherworldly level. So we'll get to that also. And of course, here are the three different machines in their you know, uh, daily manifestations. You have the, on the left, you have the latest model. There is the uh, Amazon Echo there, the cylinder, the black box cylinder. And then you have the Mars Perseverance uh, Rover, which is actually a mobile device, but you know, connected with all the other devices there. And there are, of course, other machines, and we won't go into these other machines, uh, but they are more or less directly engaged with extraction. There is this thing, there's giant excavator 288, it's called Bagger 288, uh, built by the German company Krupp, and it's a bucket wheel excavator. It's a mobile, or you can also call it a mobile strip mining machine. It's, it's huge, it's humongous. So it literally tears up the earth, digs up the earth you know, with its claws. And it's also got a lot of uh, intelligence built into it, but not so much as the Mars rover. And the bucket wheel excavator is also, a, you can say it's a direct descendant of even ancient machines. I mean, these go, these go back like 100, 150 years when you know, mining got mechanized. So on the left, you see the oldest ancestor of the bucket wheel excavator. And on the right, you see the Mars rover. And, they, and as you'll see later, they have almost kind of a similar intention. The, the idea is of digging, the idea is of extraction. Um, and here you see another machine. So this is a very interesting one. And then this only operates in the deep sea, like two kilometers under the ocean. It's called the Nautilus Auxiliary Cutter, really ugly looking machine uh, used in deep sea mining. And it it's goes and claws in there and you know scrapes off the sea floor bottom a lot of minerals are in the bottom of the sea. So deep sea mining is a big issue today. And we'll also look at that later. But, but we wanna talk about these more familiar machines we see. You know, one is which you hold in your hand, it's in your pocket, it's in your purse. The other might be in your home, if not, you know, in your office. The other is in Mars, but these are familiar machines. So it might be easier for us to relate to. So I'll jump between these three different machines. I'll try to conduct a media archeology span of sorts and unpack and extract their insights so we could clearly see the strong bonds between media and extractivism. I'll also draw theories and examples from philosophers and thinkers of Friedrich Kittler, Marshall McLuhan, Dr. Yussi Parikka, Nicole Starosielski, Lisa Parks, Siegfried Zelensky, all these thinkers of media and philosophers of media. I'll also mix this up with uh, some artistic projects from Unknown Fields Division, Balen and Cohen and others. And there are of course some definitions and terms we should be really be clear about, like what is media culture? Um, cultural expressions mediated by technology, or the study of cultural expressions as shaped by technology, or the study of uh, how even vice versa you can think about 
how new media technology is shaped by cultural expressions. And to further clarify also that no media is old or new since there's always been media. And I'll explain this soon. This is an image I always get back to with my students in my classes. Um, it's a mix of few different things over there, overlapping images, but also kind of kind of very representational of our of our planet, of our technology, or and of our body. The sort of Vitruvius man, you know, connected to the circuit board of the Amazon Echo. So there is always a causality in it, and coming back to this topic. So there's a causality about it. Things always affect each other. And there's always a feedback loop. When you open the door, the door opens you. It's, it might sound funny, but it's true. Um, so as you very well know, uh, Marshall McLuhan um, always said, medium is the message. Everyone knows that medium is the message and so on and so forth. A German philosopher, Friedrich Kittler says that media describe our situation and hence and requires a description. And to me, this description, this unpacking and retracing of steps, devices, processes, code, infrastructure is essential to uncover all these sorts of materiality of technologies. And this materiality is always connected to the geology of the earth, geology of media, and as Dr. Parekka says in the Anthropocene and his book, The Geology of Media, that media begins from the earth. Media, in fact, begins with extraction. It begins from the geology, from minerals, metals, oil, gas, lithium. And as he says, inside the earth, one finds a metallic reality, which feeds into metal metaphysics, digital devices. And thus the materiality of media starts long before even media becomes media. Um, Dr. Parikka shows in his book, The Anthropocene, um, through these literary examples of you know, Arthur Conan Doyle's Dr. Challenger, the character, Jules Verne's book. And we see that the earth is alive and its crust is tingling with life. There's a layer that pulsates like a living animal. And these are some of the early literary examples of interest in the bowels of the earth. And according to Dr. Parikka, literature perhaps even set the stage for exploration into the earth. Sometimes, you know, what we dream, sometimes we do what we, what we can imagine. In other words, there was a poetic, poetic thrust towards the living pulsating earth that perhaps opened it up for all the resources for coal, for minerals, other precious metals. I mean, especially in the Victorian era, uh, there was a deep fascination for what was inside the earth, which in a way opened the earth for exploration. And this is really fascinating to me. Um, earth metals, minerals, a lot of these, if you look back, are tied and linked to the emergence of modern media, modern engineering, modern science and technology. So there is a parallel track there, this digging in and scientific and technological expansion. So already back in the 20th century, we had mines which were already getting exhausted. We had to design new drills new drills that went even deeper and deeper. Colonies and slaves across the world were extracting metals and minerals at a fur furious pace. And we've shifted from a society which was mainly wood, brick, iron, copper, gold, and such, such. But the degree to which materials of modern technology enable and improve our state of life is, is not adequately appreciated because just even half a century ago, we had less than 12 materials, but now we have so many. Today, we have substantial materials, diversity in all kinds of products. Um, 
just as an example, if we jump into what's found in a printed circuit board, and you can see like the amount of elements which we use today. And this is according to the Society of Computer. Modern computer chips are made of 62 different elements, a lot of which are rare earth elements, and also which are found in smartphones, and which comes mostly from China, and a lot of which comes from the global south. Um, a further interesting result is that absolutely none of these metals have substitutes. So these are exemplar elements. You can't substitute gold. If you have to use gold, you have to use gold. So there's no substitutes for it. Here you can see the, all the different elements of a smartphone. It's a plethora of metals. It's a plethora of elements. In fact, almost the entire periodic table is in our pocket. And one of the most significant components of technologies are these rare earth elements. Uh, there's an example right there, neodymium, which goes into uh, uh, the speakers in your phones, speakers in your laptops. So there's like 17 of these rare earth elements and these drive communication systems from fiber optic cables, signal amplification in mobile communication towers to satellites and GPS technology. And rare earth metals are the fundamental materials that enable these technologies, these slim aesthetics of our contemporary technologies. These are enabled by these rare earth elements. So there's an element of aesthetics also there. And as our personal electronics always tend towards the invisible, they also, it also means the more the slimmer the things are in our pockets, the deeper we are digging into the ground and into the ocean. So there's this, you know, uh, radioactive tailings, there are large extraction pits, there are, you know, a lot of waste generated from that. So there is a counterweight, this sort of materiality and that materiality, uh, the device might be so little, but the, 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 the opposite of it is these landfills, which are filled with wastes. Um, so this is something very uh, significant development the last few decades and, um, and it's growing. Um, there has been several, as I said before, I'm gonna show you some artistic works around this. So there's a, project by unknown fields, uh, which I really uh, find very fascinating. Um, three ceramic vessels made from toxic mud and from this radioactive tailings in Lake Bautu in Inner Mongolia. And each vase is sized in relation to the amount of waste created. Um, there is the three items of technology there, smartphone, featherweight laptop, and a a smart car battery. So these toxic wastes, which are the other materiality of our digital technologies, they end up in this lake. Um, they end up in many parts of the world in different places. So this is a interesting way unknown fields division have approached the, 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 the after effects of technology or the afterglow of technology. One can say that these vessels are the material shadow of a valuable technological object. So let's look quickly at a short video here, which is, looks at the project.
find the project quite poetic that in taking this sort of the material waste and the material of our technologies and, and making, you know, turning them into an, a provocative aesthetic object. In a similar way, there is a, another artist, Dua Balan and Cohen, and you can see their compound, uh, compound minerals here. Um, the artists investigate multiple materialities, modes of production, long networks of contemporary technological culture. So there's a, I'm very interested in how this sort of the after effect of technology, the extractive effects of technology can also be posed as questions. So here, Balan and Cohen talk about how these are the new sort of metals and minerals, these compounds, which are the after effects and the, the outputs of our current technological culture. Um, so from bioengineering to work with rare earth minerals, metals, chemical elements of electronics, um, data centers, they investigate these long production networks. Um, they also look at how these extraction works here. Another interesting project which I wanted to show you was 75 watts. Before I get back to those three machines, this is just a digression, but let's look at this briefly. This is a performative work and it shows the bodily, the, the body and the product in, in, a, in a fabrication but as, as choreographed into a you know, performance piece. Let's move on to those three machines. Now, the point of showing you this was to also uh, bring the body into question here. So there's the machine, there's the body, there's the earth. And we are dealing with all these three different elements here. So let's get back here again. So these three machines are clearly made off and operate in and mediate cultural expressions and techniques in geological media. Long question there, but Basically, they're hardware. They symbolizes and embodies our technological media culture that also has roots in deep time. And when we say geology, we are also talking about time. We're talking about millions of years. In fact, we're talking about billions of years for these metals and minerals to form in the immense heat of the earth, deep time. In other words, much of the stuff that goes into these devices are in fact pretty ancient, not just the pyramids. You know, our iPhones are more ancient than the pyramids. So there are not only metals that goes into this, 
there's energy, fossil fuels, and that's literally the fossils of dead organisms. So it's like reshaping deep time into contemporary time. So we'll, we're talking about multiple temporalities here again. So which is what media does? Media takes the temporality of a billion years and is quickly operationalized into what Dr. Wolfgang Ernst says as microtemporality of a nanosecond execution of an algorithm. So you can imagine these vast time scales in which we operate in. There's the deep time, there's billions of years we're talking about, and then this nanosecond execution of an algorithm in your device. So at any given moment through our media, we live multiple temporalities at any given time. Now, there's a image here of uh, uh, James Hutton um, and his idea of the layers of the earth, but it's about depth. And uh, James Hutton was a geologist in his book, Theory of the Earth from 1778. He talks about depth and layers. And we need to look at also the deep time of geological media. If media comes from the earth, we need to look at the earth. And we need to look at depth because depth is not only an index of time, but depth is also a resource because it allows us to comprehend the large scale impacts of these technologies, including extraction. This deep temporality combines the spatial and the temporal. Indeed, in James Hutton's uh, book, um, Depth Means Time, under the layers of granite, you find further strata of slate for the strata of other things, which also shows this existence of deep temporalities. Every strata has a different time frame. Siegfried Zielinski, German scholar, media archeologist, thinks these geological metaphors offer a great way to investigate technological culture, especially since we realize that the plundering of the earth is what has given rise to these machines. And Dr. Parikka says this machine of the earth is one that lives off its energy resources in the same way that media devices and the political economy of digital culture are dependent on energy and minerals and metals. And then electronic waste is how the media feeds back to the earth, to the earth history and to our future fossil times. So when we talk about media cultures of extraction, we should also expand extractivism both ways. There is the digging out, but also the return. So there's the digging out and the return. So there is this dual duality about extractivism also. And the environmental condition also expands from mere natural ecology to entangles, entanglements with the technological. As Dr. Parikka says, geology doesn't refer exclusively to the ground underneath our feet. Geology becomes deterritorialized when we carry little pieces of Africa and little pieces of China in our pockets. Or when we see this sort of satellite debris, this is an artist's impression, of course, uh, it's not real, but, but we also see a growing amount of satellite debris in space, which becomes the outer reaches of the Earth's geology. So in a sense, we have the Anthropocene, the, the kind of extractive extractism, which starts from the center of the Earth, the digging of the Earth, and now all the way to outer space. Let's transition now to another related issue, that of with extractivism and it's related to purity and media and extraction. And this image you can see, for example, the different melting points and boiling points of different metals. And it's interesting because like it requires tremendous amount of heat and energy to melt something, especially if it's a metal. You can't melt iron at home. You know, you need a foundry, you need a blast furnace to melt copper iron, manganese, zinc. So there's a huge uh, 
huge effect of temperature here. Temperature is a is a sort of a companion to extraction, you could say. And media theorist uh, Nicole Starosielski looks at this and she talks about this and how geology is turned into media by nothing other than thermal manipulation. That heat, temperature changes these, the geology into stuff which we can use to fabricate, to make things. And so minerals themselves formed through the heating and the cooling of the earth, which we know we saw the layers of geology already billion years, you know, millions of years, heating, boiling, melting. So the earth itself is like a blast furnace, you could say in some sense. So there's already metals forming. And then the second formation is when you have to separate the metals from the compound. And that requires that we go into temperature for any extractive practice to succeed. We need temperature, we need heat. So temperature and th what we call as thermal practices form a great, great part of extraction and extractive practices. That's the only way we can turn things into metals, metals, pure metals, and then further on into devices. <clears throat> this is a, excuse me, this is a submarine cable construction. And you, as you can see here, a heavily armored cable. These are one of the many cables which go under the ocean. Uh, this is how your data travels across the world. It, it's not in the cloud or not in the air, but you know, these cables, which are literally laid on the bottom of the ocean. And there's optical fibers in the core of these cables, but these are heavily armored. There's a copper sheathing there. Um, and these are copper and silicon, and these are indispensable for the circuits of global communication. These are critical to our historical and contemporary media systems. Already, if you recall, telegraphy and early telephone networks, like for example, the transatlantic cable in the 1850s, they were all copper based. It was power cables. And these were essential to develop communication between mainland Europe and North America. And this is like 150 years ago. Today, we have this you know, massive internet cable networks, um, which literally bind the earth through which our data flows, through which the internet lives. And these today's optical cables and microchips require silicon, copper today is still essential for power transmission systems. Now, where do these all come from? They all, they're all coming from extraction. I mean, whether you look at it from space, um, you know, you look at Google Earth, or you imagine as a descent into the underworld, the mine has been the primary site for these metals and minerals. Digging has been uh, the only way to get at it. Um, the cultural techniques of geological excavation are digging and drilling. You know, technologies of mining penetrate the land, um, whether you know, use dynamite, use pickaxes, you use massive earth movers. And as Starosielski also says, the geologic imaginary has often been closely tied to this archeological one. Movement is always structured along this vertical axis. You know, before, as I said, from the core of the earth to outer space. In mining also, there is, it follows the same principle, this vertical axis, and which goes from the bottom to the up. And there is, and this is, and movement is always structured along that. Communications are structured along those axes. And here's the Mars rover. And you see this in the animation of our other machine, the, the sitting on top of the pyramid there, the Mars rover Perseverance. And this is just an animation. And here you can see it's drilling for samples on the surface of Mars. So, you know, we've let our devices now go to outer space and it's reached Mars and now it's drilling for samples. 
And as you look at the drill, you can find there's nothing very different conceptually from that drill bit from what you drill at home. But these drill bits are superly sanitized, superly friction free, and they literally make holes like this here. Um, so the engineering and technological principles are the same. The circuit boards, the onboard computers, the sensing equipment, let me go back to that image. They're all the same. The drill core also looks familiar. It's just on a different planet and it's just being used for scientific research. And, and this is a Mars drill hole. Um, when we, and what do we get when we dig into the earth, into the mine? That's another question. It's a lot of undifferentiated heterogeneous matter. We don't know what we're gonna find on Mars yet. Um, but when you dig into the earth, we, there's a lot of heterogeneous matter. Nothing exists purely. I mean, copper, how does copper even exist naturally? All metals exist as ores, as rocks. They're bonded to several other materials like sulfur, iron, oxygen, aluminum, hydrogen, silicon. So, and so for each ton of ore that we remove from the earth, we get few grams, maybe a kilogram of pure copper. And this varies of course, from element to element. Like in some cases, gold, you have to dig say 15 tons of, gold, uh, of ore from the ground and you get like this much gold. Um, and the rest of the stuff is of course, becomes this unresolved matter, which again, contaminated because they have been treated with chemicals and stuff like that. Um, the point is that it is impossible to locate elements as discrete phenomena at time. <clears throat> and there is a element of purity that technology requires. Without purity, a digital media would not work. So we need pure copper, or we need pure silicon, we need pure gold. So without purity, the, the current doesn't go through, right? You can't pass an electrical current through an impure copper cable. And this is what Star of CLC also talks about. This cultural investment takes place in this purity. Um, there's an image of a silicon, pure silicon. Uh, let's move on to this thermal infrared imaging. And these are just taken by machines, you know, in exploration of metals, exploration of minerals. Um, these, these are images which are used to explore mines and they're used to monitor problems, explosions, underground facilities. So this sort of a thermal infrared imaging transforms the earth also into a set of signals and that's increasingly important to the mining industry. So the earth is literally codified as a set of values. There's temperature values and the earth is mapped according to these temperature values. Not much as different what the Mars rover is doing on Mars is looking at this kind of a temperature gradients of the surface to find different minerals, find different soil matter. In the Red Sea, Atlantis too deep, one of the deepest, uh, literally the deepest deep sea mining, you could say. Um, there has been bathymetry surveys, you use sonar, you use imaging technologies to map the surface of the bottom of the sea. So, so this examination of Mars surface geology is also done by similar devices. And there is a common overlaps between a lot of these technologies which are used for extraction. Um, there's an interesting work by Estonian artist, Christina Olek. I wanted to show this work because I'm pretty impressed with this. And it draws this work from Jules Verne's 20,000 leagues under the sea. And it juxtaposes this with the current problems of deep sea mining. 
she takes these ideas forward into a visual description of the problem. Um, she uses different spatial installations and various media and materials. And she looks at this problem of deep sea mining. Um, I haven't had a chance to look at this personally, but I would definitely want to look at it again. Now back to this other machine, Amazon Echo. And this is one of the third machines and the final machine, if you might say. It's, it's the ultimate uh, device which, which, is, uh, which in a fleeting moment of interaction, it brings a lot of capacities together, human labor, resources, uh, mining, and all that into this one single interaction. You ask a question, it replies back. And with that response, you invoke, you invoke an entire regime and entire networks of resources, metals, mining, bodies, labor. So I won't go deep into it, but, but there's an image of the lithium triangle from satellite view of the lithium fields. Um, this is between Peru, Chile, and Bolivia. A lot of the world's lithiums comes from here. And as we know, lithium is one of our primary element which goes into our smartphone batteries, laptop batteries, and Tesla cars. This is another artist's rendering from the city of Vasa. Uh, it's a gigafactory. Uh, this was a gigafactory um, proposal that never went through, but just wanted to show this image, the, the, the image of a, of a battery, a giga, giga battery in the landscape surrounded by uh, these windmills. And so these sort of sort of visual, uh, uh, visual uh, interpret, visual representations of how energy and extraction and how they're represented um, in the public. The image of this volcano rarely comes to mind when we think about also all our resources, all our lithium batteries and all that. But 25 million years ago, the magma from this earth fell on the surface and brought with it lithium. And this is how the literally the lithium triangle works. Millions of years of lava flows and deposits, but we don't of course think about the volcano. Liam Young and Kate Davis from Unknown Fields say that your smartphone runs on the tears and breast milk of a volcano. This landscape is connected to everywhere on the planet via the phones in our pockets linked to each of us by invisible threads of commerce, science, politics, and power. Do I have five minutes still? Yes. So something that as robotics and artificial intelligence improve as the environmental impact cost of these industries on earth continues to increase, space-based extraction um, will become more and more viable. So I just wanted to show you this image from Astrang of this asteroid. It's called, the asteroid's called Ryugu. It's worth $30 billion. It has mostly nickel, iron, co cobalt. And as we know, cobalt is a big element uh, in our phones, in our batteries of our phones. So there has been a outwards uh, expansion in search of extraction, in search of metals and minerals, which power our devices. And of course, there's a focus on rare earth elements and platinum, which are found on asteroids that are suitable for these emerging post oil economies, as we say, which are reliant on electric vehicles, fuel cells, batteries, solar cells. Um, so you almost see that there is a, there is a digging in into the earth to find metals and minerals, this sort of extractivism, which goes into our earth. But the other 
direction of extractivism is out into space. Here again, I'd like to mention the work of artist Amelie Jacobson presents sculptures, which are abstractions of asteroids, fragmented celestial bodies. And sculptures are like investigations of the physical and bodily labor of crafting as a way of understanding how our future might. This is pretty interesting work where she takes these elements from outer space and literally crafts them as these solo individual units in a gallery space. It's a way of uh, sort of provocation, a sort of way of questioning uh, where we are going. Um, perhaps we are almost done with planet Earth. Who knows uh, that we now look up to other planets in the solar system and stars in the galaxy for comfort to search for meanings we cannot find here on Earth. Or is it that our vertical axis and reach of this Anthropocene extends now far out into space? I just wanted to end this here on the topic of extraction and extractivism with this image of the black hole. And you probably most of you have seen this image and um, it's a constructed image, of course. It's a constructed operational image um, and Benjamin Bratton, a uh, media theorist and philosopher, also talks about this black hole in his manifesto, The Terraforming. And he says the thing we see as an image was constructed from data, you know, produced not by a conventional camera, but by Event Horizon, a network of telescopes harmonized to focus on the same location at the same time. So eight ground-based um, ground telescopes focusing on the supermassive black hole at the core of this super giant elliptical galaxy, Messier 87. So it created the, the kind of network telescopes, the network data infrastructure, created a large aperture like a camera aperture as big as the earth, as wide as the earth. And to make this image, our planet itself became the camera. Peering out and looking back in ancient time, ancient light that traveled to the earth. And so the mechanism is less a camera than a vast sensing surface. It's a different kind of difference engine. And Bratton says this black hole image is part of a lineage of astronomic imaging, and always based on the folding of metals and minerals into sensory media that then render for us stunning pictures of the Earth's biosphere and technosphere, and now we are getting images from Mars. And thereby all these computational profiles also that constitute climate science. So is the Mars rover. It's a lineage of astronomic imaging. So is the iPhone, a lineage of this imaging. And so is the Amazon Echo. There are minerals, metals, all folded into devices, devices folded into planetary infrastructures and all sitting on top of these pyramids. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samir, for a really interesting presentation and and super interesting artistic um, examples of artworks that are dealing with these issues of uh, extra extractivism on our planet and and the volume of this activity. How would you describe it? Now I. Yeah. yeah, now so you're on. Repeat that kind <laughs> uh, Just a brief question on how would you describe the volume of this extractivist activist activity that we as human humanity are doing to this planet? Um, according to statistics, um, almost uh, more than 50% of the earth is affected by mining and, mm -hmm. and extractivism. More than 50% of the earth's surface. Um, directly or indirectly um, 
so there's a lot of uh, land uh, and now we are also going under the sea um, mm -hmm. so so the amount is like tremendous it's just like uh, and it's one of the biggest industries in the world mining mm -hmm. and of course the related environmental damage that happens with it so it's a pretty unregulated industry is a i mean it's a big you know stress point between governments states and mining companies and we've had we've seen many examples previously also in finland how this works and how this has worked before so yes that's right there is one question now here from the audience how how to approach the dilemma that media technologies are quite useful like now when we are listening to your online presentation but possibly most of the technologies are used for not so important purposes like entertainment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, digital media, I mean, I, I tell my students is, you know, always should be thought of as a prosthetic, as a bridge. Mm. It's supposed to be a bridge. It's not supposed to be to turn on your coffee machine or, you know, app to, you know, do silly things. Um, we should try to prioritize how we use these technologies and for what purpose. We should really critically look at them. Um, do we need this? And what's necessary? And what could make lives better? Um, where, like, for example, we, everybody knows the typewriter. The typewriter was made for blind persons. It was not made for humans, uh, like uh, people who could see. Um, so it's a prosthetic. It's the idea that we, the digital should be a bridge where there is, you know, no bridge. And um, we, yeah, we do use so much technology for entertainment. And uh, in that sense, I would say uh, it goes into the psychological realm, which I really can't answer, but perhaps it's there's a bridge there. Um, mm -hmm. Online entertainment perhaps allows us, I, I don't want to justify this or anything, but there might, there's a reason for these things happening. Um, should you binge on Netflix? Mm, maybe not. Or should mm -hmm. you, you know, you know, have so much bandwidth running continuously downloading, maybe not. Maybe there's, we should try to use this more responsibly. That's, that's all I can say on that. Yes, thank you. And it's the, it's our culture that has developed into this 24 seven culture that everything is available all the time and as much as we want. I still remember when I started working with Ihme and we produced one work for television with Susan Phillips, Scottish artist, it was still, uh, it was still the time, this was 2010, when, when there was no program at night on the Finnish television. <laughs> but it, it soon vanished, but it was about the last times that it was still so now you can all the time you can find something to, to watch also on the Finnish TV. So just given one example, but uh, we have, I think we have time for one more question if there is any, but if not, uh, I would like to thank warmly Samir for your contribution, for your thank time you and much. effort. It was a very eye-opening hour and a fantastic contribution to be part of this course. So thank you also our audience and our collaborating universities. I would like to remind you that um, that there is a link to the feedback form. We are always grateful if you take the time to, to fill it in and send it to us. And uh, I would also like to remind you that this course will continue next week. I will be speaking to you then about Ihme Helsinki and our, our, our journey towards the ecological a ecologically sustainable institution, art institutional practice, and how does this affect curating and also conversation with the artists that we work with? 
I will give a curator's view to the commissions on the way with Katie Patterson and Jana Winderen, but also some ponderings around sustainability and creating impact. So welcome next week. And uh, for the students who follow Samir to the workshop right after this lecture, please take the other link for the workshop to begin in five minutes or five past five. See you there. And thank you everyone, have a great evening. <laughs>